just want to talk to you a little bit. Okay, Lucy, what's your name? Lucy Pink. Lucy Pink, and how old is Lucy Pink? Twenty months. Ever since I was little, I loved to perform. It just came naturally to me. I always wanted to be in plays. My dad was on the radio, and I always wanted to go to the radio station and be on the air. You're listening to Jimmy Fink on 107.1 The Peak. Your face is that, Lucy. Let me see it. I always loved medicine, and I always loved the human body. One of my favorite things to do was to just type into the internet C-section birth videos and <laughs> just watch the nurses and doctors rip someone's stomach apart and pull a baby out. And I loved looking at blood and guts. I really admired Sanjay Gupta growing up, and I always said, I want to be the next Sanjay Gupta. And I guess now that I think about it, it's more the TV route that I was admiring, more so than the medical route. You and your sister went to the college together, right? Yes, we did. We both went to Johns Hopkins University. And actually, we applied to all the same colleges. We applied to, I think, seven or eight schools, and we knew we wanted to go to college together. So in our college applications, we wrote to the schools, we are applying as twins, we are a package deal, we want to go to college together, so please either accept us both or reject us both. Every single school made the same decision for us, so we either got you know, accepted or denied <laughs> to all the same places. And then we chose Johns Hopkins University. As a freshman who was intending to go down the neuroscience route, I started out taking some pre-med courses. I would come home from these classes and call Michael immediately, and I would tell him all the stuff I learned about the brain and explain how the optic nerve and the optic tract are crossing in our eyes. I thought it was so fascinating. But once I got to the campus and I started meeting other students who were also pre-med, that was when I realized, like, we are not in this for the same reasons. They had years of doing things like internships and working in hospitals, and they had been doing research, you know, being research assistants for years and years in high school. And I'm over here being like, I was the president of the drama club in high school, so I was not working in labs. And I just felt like, wow, we're very different and we're coming from a very different place and maybe I'm actually not meant to be a doctor after all. I find that I have a skill for communications and a skill for talking and a skill for being on camera, which I didn't necessarily know at the time. But I didn't realize until I started to try that it came very naturally to me and that that was a skill just like anything else. Really, what I wanted to spend the majority of my college years doing was being on camera. I'm Lucy. And I'm Noah. We're students at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. And we're here to help you learn, learn more, more, see more, be more. more. My freshman year when I was still pre-med was the year that I went into the admissions office and pitched a YouTube series. My whole vision behind the show was essentially like a travel channel-esque show about the city of Baltimore. I knew that the university had a lot of international students, so I figured there's no way these international students can all come and see what the city is like before they apply. So I wanted to give them a taste of Baltimore, basically. So I pitched this YouTube series, and the admissions counselor just sort of gave me a student film crew and a student edit crew and zero dollars of budget and said, go shoot a pilot. It became a staple series on the Hopkins admissions site. It was blasted out to all students who were applying. And I was starting to get feedback from the admissions officers that many, many students who were applying to Hopkins were writing in their applications that they applied to Johns Hopkins because they saw this series and because it made the city seem really fun and vibrant. And so by the time I was a junior, it switched from being this extracurricular activity I was doing to a paid job on campus. And it became this massive video portfolio that I got to take with me after school when I was applying for jobs. We just came from Fells Point and I got this beautiful new ring. <laughs> when I was 
a junior. I took all my video content that I had produced and I sent it over to the Today Show. And I said, I would love to intern here over the summer. They said, you're a little too young. And I said, okay, I totally get it. But if you ever need a young teen to come be on the Today Show to speak on behalf of teens, I would love to come on the show. And here's all my video content to show me on camera. I got a call one morning. They were doing a segment called Parenting Today. We're getting the inside scoop from some actual teens today. Lucy Fink is a college student at Johns Hopkins. Went to New York, did not sleep a wink, and was live on the Today Show the next day. As kids, we want our own space. And so they wound up inviting me back I think another six or seven times. You know, I've helped my, my siblings in the past. I was a counselor at camp. Teens in our generation, we are so used to the internet and we grew up in live chat rooms, talking to strangers, meeting these people that... And by the time I graduated from college, after my senior year, not only did I have a whole YouTube show that I had as a portfolio, but I also had multiple appearances showing myself on live television and showing what I could do in a live setting. So I had a pretty robust portfolio upon graduating. When I graduated college, to be completely honest, I was a little lost. Before looking for a job, my first thought was maybe I should just try to get a talent agent. So I reached out to some New York agents and showed them my YouTube videos from Johns Hopkins University. So join us next time to learn more, to learn more, to learn more, to see more, be, be more. more. I was like, do you want to rep me? And they were like, no. This agent isn't gonna rep me. I don't wanna be on the news. I think I need to figure out a new plan for myself here. I had actually dabbled in some news reporter hosting segments in college. I'm standing on North Charles Street, the main road running through the Johns Hopkins University's Homewood campus, where construction has been ongoing since late 2012. I kind of felt like the only way to be on camera as a full-time job was to either be a news reporter or to work in like entertainment and to be a celebrity gossip, red carpet type reporter. And to be honest, neither of those really spoke to me. Now that I know what I don't wanna do, maybe I should just go the behind the scenes production route. Forget about the on-camera stuff for now. And that was what led me to my first job out of school, which was at Ogilvy & Mather, the advertising agency. I was hired as a PA, a production assistant, and Ogilvy had this amazing environment where they were always encouraging people to be makers and creators. There was one particular day when I just had nothing to do and I saw a tripod and a camera that was not being used and I picked it up and I brought it into a conference room with me and I had this little marshmallow that had a face on it. It looked like a hedgehog. And I just came up with this idea of what if I made a little stop action animation movie of this hedgehog? I sort of got the general principles of, you know, if I take a still image one after the other while I'm subtly moving the hedgehog from shot to shot, and then I string it together on the back end, it will look like the hedgehog is moving on its own. And I just filmed a little movie. The hedgehog came on screen, he thought for a second, he got this brilliant idea, he takes a napkin and he throws it over a piece of chocolate and then does some abracadabra stuff, pulls the napkin off and there's the second hedgehog and they kiss. And I took about 500 photos. And then I went to Google and I said, how to convert raw photos to JPEGs. And then I said, how to pull a selection of JPEGs into iMovie. And then I figured out how to import them in mass into iMovie. And then I typed in how to make an image appear for 0.2 seconds in iMovie. And then I, you know, copy pasted all the settings. I added some music. I added a couple graphics to it and I uploaded it to Facebook. I just wanted my friends to see it. I was like, I made magic. This is cool. <laughs> and it, it was a nine hour project by the end of the day, but it felt like it went by in a flash. It just flowed out of me and it was fun. And I remember thinking maybe this is what it's like to be an artist, to just love what you're doing so much that it's pouring out of you and that you don't even remember how difficult it was because the experience was on cloud nine. So this is how I used to shoot stop motion videos back in the day before I had any cameras or softwares, I would just do it on my iPhone. So basically I knew that I needed like a top down bird's eye view setup, but I didn't know how to get my phone to just hang <laughs> in the air. My plan was taking a desk chair like this and just flipping it upside down. And then I would take some tape 
and I would just like put my phone facing the floor as best as possible and then tape it down. Now it's being held in place. So then I would have all of these construction paper backdrops that I just kept under my bed so that it filled up the frame. And that would be my brightly colored backdrop. So then I would take an object. I'm just going to use this little bee as an example. But I'd put it down and I'd take a photo. Then I'd move it a little and take a photo. Can you see it? Yeah. So we just did that. Nice. Pretty cool. So yeah, I would come home every single day for months and just animate inanimate objects. <laughs> and I started sharing one after the other on my Instagram probably at least three a week for a few months. The first brand that reached out to me was a company called Fancy. So she said, how much would you charge for a 15 second video? I had been making these videos for free, for fun, at home, for months. And I called my mom and I was like, what can I charge for a 15 second video? And my mom said, I have no idea, Lucy, a hundred dollars maybe? And so it said to the woman, it would cost a hundred dollars. And I think this woman felt so bad for me <laughs> that she gave it a beat and then she said, We have $500 for the campaign. Do you want that? And I said, okay, great, I'll take 500. It was like so hard to accept money for this because it was just so fun to do and I had never thought of turning it into a job. I was just doing it for fun. I uploaded it to my Instagram and put a couple hashtags on it and then the next week, a business card company in England reached out and said, and I said $500. So I did a few at the $500 rate and then after I had done, I don't know, maybe five or six, I just thought, what if I just double the rate? Who knows? So one of the brands that came to me, I said, my rate's $1,000. And they said, okay, now my new rate was $1,000. And I was like, Fake it till you make it was my slogan. Every brand is a different size and every brand must be working with a different budget. Why don't I stop giving out a rate and instead ask the brand, what budget are you working with? Because maybe they're working with a wildly larger budget and I'm you know, slicing it in thirds because I just didn't ask. So I remember one brand in particular, it was the biggest brand I had ever worked with and that had ever reached out to me. And I said, I'm not gonna give them a rate. I'm gonna ask them their budget. So I said, what's your budget for this Instagram campaign? And they took a couple days and then they emailed me back and they said, we know it's low, we're so sorry, but it's the end of the year, our budget is max 4K. And I had never done anything for more than 1K. And I saw this and I freaked out, screamed, you know, jumped around the apartment and then calmly replied back, I can make it work for 4K. <laughs> I just could not stop telling people at Ogilvy that I wanted to be on camera. <laughs> and everyone I met, I would tell them, this is my hope and dream. I told so many people and actually Ogilvy gave me a chance to create a video for Ogilvy, just for the internal company that I got to host. As a new hire, I made a bucket list. Fun things that I'd like to do around the Ogilvy New York office with John Seifert. Chairman of Ogilvy and Mather North America. And I, John Seifert, the chairman of Ogilvy and Mather North America said, why the heck not? And there was one woman in particular who was, I believe, the chief content officer of Ogilvy and Mather North America. And I snagged a meeting with her. And it was not an interview. I already had the job. <laughs> I was already working there. But I totally treated the meeting with her as if it were a job interview. And I spent the entire 20 minutes showing her all my work samples and telling her everything I can do and telling her everything I wanted to do. And I could see in that meeting with her, I could see her going from being completely uninterested in me when I walked in the room and thinking, oh, it's just another young employee who wants to pick my brain for career advice, to by the end of my 20 minutes with her, her wheels were turning and she was thinking, you know, 
how can we use this girl at Ogilvy? And by the end of the meeting, she said, follow me. And she brought me over to the creative team at Ogilvy, which I was not on, I was on the production team. And she introduced me to all these young creatives. One month later, that woman became the COO of Refinery29. Fast forward two months, she starts her job and she's doing her thing at Refinery29 and one day she sends me a Facebook message. Hey, how are you? And I'm like, I'm doing great, how are you? And her response says, okay, I'm just gonna cut to the chase. I think you should come work for Refinery29. It's a super cool company, a lot of women, we're doing really cool things. I think you'd love the video team, let me know if you wanna talk. I still did not know what Refinery29 was and to be totally honest, in my mind, I thought Ogilvy and Mather was this huge, giant advertising agency of a company, and I thought Refinery29 was just this mini startup that was going nowhere. I I remember I even called my parents to tell them about it. I, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's a crazy idea. But I did take the meeting. So I'm in the interview at Refinery29, and she says to me, so what do you want to do? I just started rattling off all the things that I really wanted to do. So I want to shoot YouTube videos. I want videos. to host videos. I want to make stop motion I want to produce. Videos. I want to write the script. I would also really I like also to come up with the I'm a bit of a writer. I was a creative writing major, so I'd like to write articles. I want to work with brands. I want to do editorial pieces. I just sort of shot out everything I could possibly think of. And as I'm saying everything, she's sort of typing on the back end of her computer. I thought she was just taking notes. She turns her computer around and she has an offer for a job, which has the job description that I just said. And she said, you can put whatever title you want in there if you want this job. In the interview process, they had asked me if I had any ideas. And I had about five or six video series ideas, one of which was Try Living with Lucy. Okay, so this was my first time going out of the office and shooting. Do you know where I could buy an alarm clock around here? An alarm clock? Where are we right now? We're in Greenwich Village. That was before I knew the city. Now when I watch that, I know exactly where I was, but I had literally no idea where I was. I thought I was like in Queens or something. And I had pitched this to them in my interview, but I had pitched five other shows, so I didn't know what I was gonna really do when I got there. I was technically associate producer slash on-camera talent. So I knew that I was being hired to be on camera in some way, but I didn't have the show yet or there was nothing really that I was told to do. So I walked over to the head of our programming and I said, what should I do? <laughs> do you have a job for me? And he said, what do you mean? You pitched us six video series. Just pick one and go shoot a pilot. I picked the first episode topic, which was the week I didn't use my cell phone. And the next day I left my phone in my apartment, locked up, came to the office to shoot this new video and realized that I needed my phone to shoot it. So I was asking my coworkers, can I borrow your cell phone to shoot me being five days without my cell phone? By the end of a week of footage with no phone, I pulled all the footage into Adobe Premiere and I tapped one of the junior editors and I begged him to please help me edit this into a video. We worked nights together for three days and made this little video and I showed it to the head video team manager. <laughs> what do you call him? He watched it with the most stoic expression you could imagine. And then at the end, he just goes, cool, make another. And I was like, okay. I shoot the next, he watched it, he chuckled, he was stoic, he said, cool, make another. <laughs> we did that probably four times. And on the fourth, he said, okay, we're now gonna upload your first one to YouTube this Friday, and now you're four weeks ahead, keep going. And eventually it started selling to brands and it started becoming one of the staple shows on Refinery's YouTube channel and was bringing a large new audience New people coming every day. Hey guys, it's Lucy Fink. I'm a video producer at Refinery29, but every so often I like to try other people's jobs. This is Lucy for Hire. Over my years at Refinery29, I witnessed my own social media channels growing. I watched as brands slowly started approaching me and slowly started wanting content from me. And at first they wanted my refinery content. So at first they wanted, you know, episodes of Charlotte with Lucy and 
my series, but over time, it was becoming clear that more and more brands wanted to work with me off of Refinery's platforms. There was actually one week where at once I got three emails and calls from three separate talent agents and managers in LA and I took all the meetings. Actually, the only one that I liked <laughs> is the woman who is actually my agent today. So she was the only female that I met with amongst a sea of men. At the point at which I left Refinery29, that was when I really started to think of myself as a little bit less of a person and a little bit more of a brand and a company. If I was a brand and a company, I needed to be branded. I needed to be recognizable as a brand. I was starting to establish a brand for myself in terms of the colors I was naturally gravitating towards and the stuff I was using, but I had never had a formalized brand as a business. And because I really am trying to establish myself as a media personality and producer and a person who can create high quality content for brands, I wanted to make sure that my brand looked like a professional brand as well. I started poking around the internet for graphic designers and that was when I discovered Brighton Me. I feel like my current brand is just not really speaking to where I am in life right now. I just need your like expertise and, and thoughts on based on the mood board I sent you, like what direction you would go in for me. I love all of the like bold geometric elements. Like I feel like we can have a lot of fun and make it feel super playful, but at the same time, not using like overly primary colors, right? She's like, not just thinking about what looks pretty, but she's also thinking about what is the experience of someone coming to my website and what are they trying to get out of it? She can bring forth that like positive, uplifting energy and also speak directly to women that you're impacting. I'm obsessed with this mood board and this color palette. Normally when you work with a graphic designer, they'll send you the first proof and then you can kind of give notes and make a hundred changes. I saw the first presentation she sent me and I was like, you got it, you captured it, this is it. I had done a lot of digging around on the internet, looking at websites that I liked and trying to figure out what it was about them that I liked so much. And I realized that yes, while a lot of it was the branding, another major part of what was making certain websites stand out to me was the photography that was used. And the fact that all the photos fit with the color scheme and echoed the elements and the illustrations that were being used in the graphics on the page. And I thought, I just am gonna need to do a photo shoot. Bronson Farr is a very talented photographer. He and his husband, Sam, often work together and they just are this dream team. Um, we've already had a couple of ideas between the two of us. Seeing all those beautiful shapes that have been created for your brand seem so incredible and like ownable to you that we can bring those to life. My brain was first thinking very small. So I was thinking maybe we would rent out an apartment in the city and tape some seamless paper to the wall. We're gonna produce this whole shoot for you. So whatever ideas we come up with, we're gonna be in charge with bringing them to life. So yes, we'll get the studio space, we'll get the team together. They just had the vision for how to take this deck that Brianna had made for me and how to bring it to life through imagery. And I was a little bit nervous about moving in this direction because it was a huge financial investment and I had literally never spent money like this on my business. I had this like fearful moment of like, do I want to lose this money? And then I realized you're not losing it. You're investing it to get to the next level. There were about 12 to 15 people on set doing all sorts of things from building the sets and painting the props. And it felt very strange for me because I'm used to being on set for brands and seeing the client on set, you know, the person who's paying for the shoot, and I'm used to just being the talent in the shoot. But in this case, I was the client. It was just like the most legitimate set I had ever been on, and it was my project. And I felt so proud to be employing these people, and I felt so proud to be doing a big project on behalf of my brand and really investing in Lucy Fink Media, knowing that it was gonna yield these beautiful images that would live with my brand for years to come. The website building process was also totally magical. Brianna was, you know, on the back end of the website, building it and adding in the photos as I sent them to her and 
I now have this website that is exactly what I want it to be. I just want to dive into the website and swim around in the colors and in the pages because it's so everything I could have ever wanted. So introducing Lucy Pink Media 2.0 to the world. And I hope that you look through the website and feel what I feel, which is just joy and peace and ease. That's what I hope for. Okay, make a happy face. Look at the camera. Okay, make a sad face. Okay, make a mad face. Okay, say goodbye everybody. Goodbye everybody. Say I love you. I love you. Go kiss. Amelia.